Ready? Well, good morning. It's good to see you here this fabulous Lord's Day. And uh, no better way to begin our worship of the Lord in uh, seeing someone follow the Lord in believer's baptism. This is Ollie Cook. Ollie, on February the 19th, received Christ. Him and his dad was traveling somewhere, and uh, he received Christ on his own in that regard. And uh, he is now a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, an unashamed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ollie, do you profess the Lord Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord, Master, and Savior? And because you do, I baptize you, my little brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in the beautiful likeness of his death and raised in the glorious likeness of his resurrection. Amen. And Ollie, our, our Lord on the Sermon on the Mount, he asked us to be salt and light. May you be salt and light as you begin your journey in Jesus and on mission for him every day. God bless you, my brother. Amen. Father, Lord, we're so thankful for the glorious gospel. Thank you, Lord, for salvation full and free. Thank you for redeeming Ollie, drawing him unto yourself, gripping him with the gospel and him responding to your saving grace. And Lord, for others who may be here today without Jesus, may today be the glorious day for which they enter into the most greatest and grandest relationship they ever will enter into, and that is one with you. So Lord, may you be high and lifted up and glorified in all that we do here this Lord's day. And we pray this in the great I am's name, in the name of Jesus, amen, amen.
will, amen, and he will change your life, amen? And uh, we're so thankful to have you as our guest here today. We're honored and blessed. And pray God's richest blessings upon you as we worship the one and only and our soon coming king. Uh, in just a moment, Brian's gonna share with you how you can let us know you engage with us in worship, either here live or in per live and in person or on live, live stream. Uh, but please indicate uh, what you may have as a prayer request on the back side of that guest card so that we can pray for you um, this new week. We had a glorious event Friday night, our Low Country Boil. Um, I shared some pictures. There you go. There, the man just kept coming. This building was full. I mean, just packed out every square inch of it. And uh, we're so thankful, Brother Phil. Honored to have you, dear brother. Uh, and how the Lord moved and stirred hearts Friday night. Looking forward to today. We're very, very blessed to have you behind God's sacred desk this morning. We had about 20 decision cards. So we want to pray for those who surrender their lives to the Lord Jesus Friday night. And continue to pray for those who may still be wrestling with the gospel. That the Holy Spirit will continue to do his work and draw them unto him so we're grateful and thankful, again, for the Lord's working. Uh, today, we're launching our week of prayer for our, our, our North American Mission Board missionaries. We have provided for you this prayer guide. Please, please take this with you each day. Engage it in your devotion time, your private prayer time, because the greatest thing we can fuel these missionaries with is prayer. And uh, we're going to introduce you to one just here in a minute. Um, but we want to pray for them and then also give towards the, the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Again, all of these funds go straight to the North American Mission Field in Canada. And uh, you're, you can be on mission by your giving and certainly by your praying. Um, and, and we're looking forward to how I, got, I can't see, folks. I just got to get my glasses. It's awful when you can't see, and it's really even bad when you can't see in here. We want to pray for them, and so um, intercede for them in a, in a great and mighty way. We also have Hope for the Hill is going to be on mission. The D.C. flag is flying. Um, they're going to be showing a, a, a preview to the House of Reps and Senators tomorrow night. And, and, and this is a gathering that they normally wouldn't gather to, but they will come, and they're going to preview this film called Cabri, Cabrini. And it's about saving children from the wrath of the enemy um, a great opportunity to expose the gospel. And then Tuesday and Wednesday, they'll be entering in the doors of House of Reps offices, Senators' offices, uh, on representing Hope for the Hill. So pray for that mission. Nathan Kistler will be leading them. We're going to intercede for them this morning um, as well and pray God to do a great and mighty work. I want to thank, for, again, all of those who served in the Low Country Boil. Men, you outdone yourselves in serving the body of Christ and serving our community, uh, serving our other men and other churches. Thank you for your labor of love and the great work that you have done for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let me also remind you to vote Tuesday. It's Super Tuesday, I do indeed believe. You always hear me say, take your Bible in one hand, your ballot in the other. Vote biblically, folks. Plain and simple, honor the Lord in your voting. This is crucial, and um, it's a privilege. It is a privilege. Um, so let's take that seriously and represent the Lord in that regard. Without further ado, I wanna introduce you to Faith. I believe it's Faith Garland. And uh, she serves faithfully in a very unique mission field here in North America. There are so many that don't know Jesus in the city of Boston. I lead the Beloved Initiative, which is an anti-trafficking and sexual abuse awareness campaign. My ministry right now looks like reaching our refugee friends and their families, our homeless friends, and also women who are experiencing exploitation. There are so many parts to the equation. We look for, you know, creative ways to, you know, meet needs. I'm really passionate about gifting essential products, but it's the importance of leaving the pews and going out and being the light and love of Jesus. We have volunteers within our churches. We're creating, you know, earrings and bracelets to then use those for our street outreach. We can um, just bless um, women that are in strip clubs or on the street. And the goal is just really that the loss will be reached with the love of Christ. When people give to the Annie Armstrong offering, uh, individuals are receiving Christ and realizing their beloved identities as beloved sons and daughters. Your generous support is going towards so many individuals who do not have a relationship with Jesus, helping them realize that they are loved and loved by Christ. 
A very integral ministry. Um, the sex trafficking industry is um, a very dangerous and a million plus dollar industry, unfortunately, in our land. And it's not just women, but it's boys and girls, and in some cases, men. And so we want to pray for Faith as she ministers in that regard. And again, please keep your prayer guide handy this week in interceding for these dear brothers and sisters who are serving our very lost land, the United States. Please pray for the Peyton family. Miss Susan went home to be with the Lord very unexpectedly last Wednesday. Her service will be here this afternoon at 2. So please continue to pray for Derry and Abby and Stephanie and Zach and the whole entire family um, as they um, transition uh, during this time and ask the Lord to have his favor and divine use of that service this afternoon. Stephanie Rainwater's dad also went home to be with the Lord. He's been ill for quite some time. And um, please play for Stephanie. Keith just lost his stepfather uh, within the week or so, so they've had a lot of tragic situation come their way. I want to pray for the Rainwater family as well. Your verse for today is 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Again, a very integral passage which we know quite well. Um, but the key thing is if, 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 if my people, um, which are called by my name, the believers, body of Christ, humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, turn from their wicked ways, then, if then, will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, heal their land. This is a verse we certainly want to implement and apply daily, but certainly as we have this election season this year, um, our, our country needs Christ, our leaders need Christ, but we, the body of Christ, want to humble ourselves and seek the face of God, revive the church of God for him to do his work, his will, his way. Our missionary prayer calendar today calls for Murray Tillis. Uh, Light of Messiah Ministries, reaching uh, Jewish individuals with the salvation of the gospel, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, and also the Pushtan People Group, which we adopted several years ago. We want to pray for those individuals and ministries as well this morning. It's kind of our opportunity, and I don't want this to turn into just a ritual tradition or whatever you want to call it, but to still ourselves before the Lord and uh, get our minds and hearts in, in tune with the Lord Jesus. And if there's anything that might need to be confessed, cleaned out this morning before we proceed, another ounce of worship, now's the time. May we still ourselves right here, right now, before the feet of Jesus, position ourselves to hear a great word from him today, and may he do a change in our lives. You still, and I'll close this out in prayer. Father God, we're so thankful for the wonderful privilege and opportunity it is, indeed it is to have gathered. In these facilities you have graced us and blessed us with, we, we, we give you the honor and glory for such a privilege and freedom. There are many in this world who cannot congregate. Uh, they have to meet without, with, with fear, persecution, even placing their lives in danger. And then on top of that, Lord, many of them do not even have one verse in their, in their known tongue. And we're grateful to have full copies of your word at our disposal, written form, electronic fashion. You have graced us and blessed us beyond measure. May we never, ever take these blessings for granted. Lord, we intercede this morning for the uh, Peyton family and the Rainwater family. Uh, Lord, I pray, God, you'll see them through this time of grief. You know exactly what and how they're feeling. Minister your word to them, God. See them through these forthcoming days of transition. We thank you, Lord, for the souls that were saved Friday night. God, we pray for their spiritual growth development, them getting grounded now in their walk with you and begin this wonderful process we know as sanctification. Help us to come along their side faithfully and obediently to assist in that process. And Lord, for others who have, have as of yet to receive you, oh God, we pray the Holy Spirit will continue to draw them unto yourself. We pray for Murray Tillis. We pray for, the, for his ministry there as he reaches Jews with the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the light of indeed the Messiah. We pray that you'll continue to find favor with him, good days of health, fruit for his labor, and certainly, Lord, souls as he seeks the gospel to be put forth. Pray for the Pushtan people group. Lord, a very lost, un, unreached people group. We pray, God, that you will send believers Lord, with the good news of the, of the gospel, the truth of the gospel to be shared their way and may their hearts be open, Lord, to the receptivity of the gospel, I pray. We thank you for Faith Garland who serves in, in, in reaching these who have been gripped by the enemy and sex trafficking, God. I pray that you'll continue to use her and give her provision, Lord, fruit for her labor, wisdom, discernment, insight as she reaches in this very unique mission field. 
We pray for Hope for the Hill this week, God. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would be with Nathan and the team. Lord, that you would use him to expose the love of the Lord to our congressmen and women, House of Representatives men and women. And Lord, we pray for their soul and salvation. We pray for our president, his cabinet, who needs Christ. We pray, Lord, that the believers there on Capitol Hill, you'll bolster them in their faith and use them, I pray, in a rich and mighty way, oh God, to bring the gospel to the hill. Lord, I thank you for Brother Phil and Lord for how you have used him in so many phenomenal ways over the time, course of history. And I pray that, Lord, you'll use him here today, oh Lord. Use him, Lord, I pray, to edify the body of Christ. And Lord, again, once again, expose the gospel to the lost and dying. Thank you for his faithfulness, his obedience. Bless and grace him, I pray. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for the glorious good news of the gospel that you have entrusted us with. May we be good, faithful servants of that gospel. And we pray this and plead the blood of Jesus over everything by which we've prayed. We pray it in a grave spirit of humility and we pray it in the name of the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen and amen. amen. Well, I'm not sure if you really caught what Brother Stephen said a little bit ago. You know, when our team wins, we celebrate and we cheer and we stand to our feet and we just cheer on our winning team whenever they win the national championship. And I'm telling you, Team Jesus won Friday night. Twenty men gave their hearts to the Lord. Let's give the Lord a, a hand clap of praise. Isn't that exciting? I'm telling you, that's what it's all about. Men coming to know the Lord and leading their family and then making a difference in the lives of those that they influence. What a wonderful thing uh, to be able to celebrate that this morning. Also, we have one other celebration this morning. Miss Aveline, 90 years old. Will you stand up and show them what 90 years old looks like? Nothing to it, is it? Isn't that awesome? I love it. Happy birthday. We're so proud of you. Miss Aveline served as one of our deacon's wives for 20-something years and uh, served our church and also worked in senior adult ministry years ago. And so we're so thankful for you and thank you for being faithful and for serving Jesus, for being in God's house every Sunday and just always praying for us and being our prayer warrior. We love you and our church loves you today. Guest, if this is your first or second time with us today, we'd like to greet you and get to know you a little better. And uh, we have a packet of information for you. It tells you a little bit about the church. Inside there is a guest card. Please take that thing out, fill it out this morning. You can drop it in the offering plate or you can give it to one of these ushers this morning. Or you can leave it at one of the welcome desks as you leave. But please let us know that you're here. You're our special guest and we want to greet you and get to know you a little better. If you have your electronic devices, you can also text the, the word guest to the number that's on the screen. Please let us know uh, that you're here today, all right? So we can find you and greet you and have a wonderful time of fellowship. Will you please remain seated? Members, will you please stand, turn around and greet all of those around you now as our musicians play.
Take that clap of praise today. Aren't you thankful for his strength and his wonderful salvation? Let's pray, pray together. Let's ask God to bless and anoint this offering we're about to receive. Let's ask God to just move in your heart today. It's a personal thing. Do you know him? If you don't know him, today's the day to give your heart to him. If you do know him, do you truly believe? And are you trusting him every day? Let's pray together. God, we love you. We thank you so much, God, for this opportunity just to come together and worship your name in spirit and in truth. And God, we give all of our praise back to you. You are worthy of it all. And God, we're thankful that we can lift our voices in one accord to your name, the name above all names, the name whereby men might be saved. Today, if there be one that's here today that's lost or viewing online or struggling with their salvation, trying to figure out how to put the pieces together, oh, Lord, how I pray today that you'll move in their heart with your precious Holy Spirit. And, God, that you'll do a work in them that will change their life forever. And may they commit to you. I pray that you'll use the words that Brother Phil will share today to penetrate deep within their hearts, to draw them to the everlasting love that you have for them today. God, I pray that you'll just take care of our church, continue to, to bind Satan, help us to keep pressing on, to serve you, Lord, and to be about your business. Bless this offering we're about to receive. How blessed we are, God, through the diligence of your people's tithes and offerings. And, oh, Lord, how we pray, God, you'll continue to bless, and we'll continue to go, and we'll continue to reach, and we'll continue to, to tell the lost about you. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
copy of God's Word and open it to the Gospel according to Luke chapter 15. Luke's Gospel chapter 15, and thank you choir and worship team, Brother Bryant, boy, that was good. I tell you, you know, I travel all the time and speak in churches, and every once in a while, I just want to tell churches, you don't realize how good you've got it musically. I, let me say that again. You don't realize how good you have it musically. If you, uh, if you don't believe that, come travel with me for a week or two. I go to some churches, and if you're in the military, you'll understand this. They ought to give me combat pay for having to preach after they sing. You know what I mean? <laughs> Um, and, and you think, man, you know, I mean, people get up and they sit in the choir and, you know, they look like they're mad at God, you know, and the congregation's looking like, I dare you try to bless me, you know, just no joy in the church at all. And so when I go where there's great music and honors the Lord, it blesses me. And what a thrill it is to be here. Thank you, Brother Stephen for, and Scotty for making it opportunity. Um, this is the first time I got here. I got here as fast as I could, but this is my first time. And what a delight it was to be here Friday night with all of the men and to be able to share and then to be here this morning and to see so many of you that I have met or we have met from a distance because quite a number of you come to a conference we do in Pigeon Forge called Celebrators. Uh, in the old days, we would say it was for senior adults, but we've discovered nobody wants to be a senior adult, uh, truthfully. Uh, nobody wants to be, so we just call them mature believers. Everybody likes that, and <clears throat> it's another way of saying old people. But, but the truth is, I tell people all the time, if you've never been to an event like Celebrators, we're doing it this fall in Pigeon Forge, and uh, the Bill Gaither Vocal Band is going to be there. A group called Signature Sound is going to be there. Uh, Natalie Grant, who's more of a contemporary but a wonderful singer, is going to be there. Dr. David Jeremiah is going to be there. Uh, Charles of Billings. We just have a big time. And I have to tell people all the time. You say, well, I'm not old enough to go to that. I, I understand you're 104, but, but it's still okay to come. Because i got to tell you something. The funnest people in the world are older adults. In fact, I tell all of my youth director friends, or student ministers, they call them now at churches, you, you need to quit doing that, even though it's important. You need to start leading all the senior adults. And they'll say, why? I say, let me tell you the difference between a group of teenagers and a group of 80-year-old people. You've got to think about it. They'll both go on trips, except the old people go to bed. <laughs> Try <it. laughs> I said, and if you go with the old group, you never have a mama calling you complaining about what you did. And you don't have to worry because they're all supposed to be on drugs. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> That's the big difference. And so I tell them we just have a great time because, you know, when you get older, and everybody in this room, you know, that's older, you understand what I mean. You just reach a point in the life, you might as well just laugh at yourself. You know, and it's great to be there. And by the way, you pray for your pastor. He told me yesterday in two months he turned 60. He's going to be a senior adult. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> he might not have wanted me to tell that, so I've enjoyed being here. But the truth is I told him embrace it. It's wonderful, and I'm just so glad. So I hope you can come and be with us. Now with your Bible open, would you stand to your feet? We're going to read this morning the wonderful story of the prodigal son, or what I like to call the story of a wonderful father. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, beginning in verse 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me. Now I want you to note those two words, give me, the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me 
as one of thy hired servants. Those two words make me stand in contrast to what he said in verse 12 when he said, give me. And he arose and came to his father. And when he was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Father, speak to our hearts today, for it's in Jesus' name we're asking. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Some years ago, I was invited to a church to speak, and I did not know the pastor well. As a matter of fact, that was one of the first times he and I had met. And so when we finished the morning service, uh, he and his wife, we went to a nearby restaurant, and the three of us were sitting there fellowshipping and getting to know each other. So we naturally began to talk about our families and our kids and our grandkids. And over the course of our conversation, the pastor and his wife told me that they had five adult sons. And four of their sons, they went into detail about their lives, how they were active in church and how they were serving the Lord. But there was one son they never mentioned. And I really didn't think much about it until a few days after I arrived home, the pastor's wife wrote me a letter and she said, Brother Phil, I really think that I need to complete the story. She said, I apologize for not telling you about our fourth son. She said, you know, of all of our five kids, he was the one who enjoyed church the most. When we were young and we were in church, he, he loved everybody. He, he loved to go on all the trips that they, all the students would go on. He sang in the choir. He, he loved church. In fact, she said, if I had to pick which of, my hus- of our, our five sons would follow my husband in ministry, it would have been our fourth son. But shortly after he graduated from high school and he went to college, we began to hear reports that he was doing things that broke our heart. And one day he came home to inform us that he had decided to quit college. He was going to get married. We later learned what we suspected. The girl he was marrying was already expecting their first child. They married. The baby was born. All seemed to be well. Then he began having an affair with a woman where he worked, and before long, he had left his wife and child. They divorced. He moved in and lived with that woman, but that relationship didn't last long, and then there was another one and another one. She said, today, he lives out of state. We do have communication with him, but when we talk to him, he makes it very clear that we're not to talk about God or church or spiritual things. She said, Brother Phil, he is our prodigal. And she said, but, you know, I'm really not writing you this letter to give you the details about our son as much as I'd like to ask you two questions. One, what did we do wrong? I mean, how can you have five kids who have the same parents, go to the same schools, attend the same church, live in the same communities, and to some degree even have the same associates and friends? How can... Five boys grow up and four serve God and one becomes a prodigal. So with that son, what did we do wrong? And she said, the second question is, what can we do now to get our son back into a right relationship with the Lord? Well, I don't have to tell you, when I read those questions, that wasn't the first time I've heard those two questions. As a traveling preacher, there is rarely, rarely a day goes by that someone does not tell me about a son or a daughter or a grandchild, sometimes it's a sibling, but someone in their family who once served God who has walked away. And the parents will always want to ask, what did I do wrong and what do I do now? Now, they may not ask it in the form of a question. They may make a statement like, Brother Phil, I I don't know what I did wrong, and I don't know what to do now, but pray for us. But you're really asking those two questions. And every person sitting in this auditorium today who has a child that has made poor choices, that their hearts are far from God, you understand what I mean when you have asked those two questions, what did I do wrong, and what can I do now? Well, I set out on a journey. I said, I'm going to answer those two questions. 
So I went to the scriptures and I read everything I could find about wayward children, prodigal children, rebellious children. I read everything I could find in the word of God. And you don't hear a preacher say this very often, but initially I did not find the answers to those two questions. So I thought, well, maybe I, I need to go read some books and see how some others have handled this subject. And so when I began to research, I discovered very few books have been written to address those questions. There are several books that are testimonies, either from a parent's perspective or from a child's perspective who returned to serving God. But no one had really tried to answer those two questions. So I just thought, well, I'll see how some preachers have handled it. And I, I couldn't find messages that addressed it. So I thought, well, I don't have the answers. And so I guess it's just not for me to address. So I pushed it away. But if you're a Christian, you will understand what I mean. There are times in your life when you push something away and the Holy Spirit just pushes it right back. Well, I had one of those experiences. I mean, it was like every time I, I would try to push it away, the Lord would push it back. People would come into my life. And I remember it, this became a burden of my heart. And I really wanted to be able to help people who have children who've walked away. And I can remember I preached one night in Missouri. It was a, a special focus in the service, but it wasn't about family, parenting, kids, nothing like that. Far from it. And I remember we finished the service and I was standing near the front and this lady walked up to me who I'd never met and she said, may I speak a word with you? And so we were kind of here and so we just kind of moved over to the side so we could have a little bit of privacy. And she looked at me and she said, Brother Phil, I need to tell you, I, I didn't hear a word you said tonight. She said, because I sat back there and I cried. She said, my daughter has got some real problems. She's made some horrible choices. And she began to tell me about her daughter. And then she looked at me and she said, I cannot explain this, but while you were preaching tonight, the Lord told me I was to come and ask you two questions. What did I do wrong? And what do I do now? Well, I tried to encourage her, prayed with her, but I can remember later that night, I, I'd gone back to the hotel room where I was staying and I walked in and I just put my jacket across a chair and I literally can remember I fell onto the bed and my heart was breaking and I said, Lord, I, I can't go on. I mean, you've given me this burden to help people with wayward children, but yet I have no answers and I, I've searched the scriptures. I've done everything I know to do. And I said, so Lord, I, I gotta ask you, one of two things has gotta happen. Either give me insight or remove this burden. And then I said, and Lord, while you're deciding what you're going to do, I'm going to bed. <laughs> and I went to sleep. And around two o'clock in the morning, I can remember it was like the light turned on or someone walked into the room and I, I jumped up and I clicked on the light and I got a piece of paper and I started writing, not ideas, not thoughts. I started writing names of people that I knew on a very very well that that who were either prodigals or were prodigals who recently returned to serving the Lord and I would write a name and another name and another name and another name people that I knew well until finally I wrote a name and quite frankly I don't think I could have thought of my own name after I wrote that one and I looked at the list and there were 30 names now this may have been a coincidence I don't know but there were 15 who were still prodigals and 15 who were prodigals who were now serving the Lord and when I looked at that list, I need to tell you, everything you can imagine was represented on that list. Every kind of addiction. There were some kids who morally were good kids, but they had intellectually walked away from their faith. There were some on there who, who had really had some serious uh, sexual sins in their life. One was incarcerated for a serious felony. And when I got home, I contacted all 30. And I said, listen, I, I'd like to interview you. I, I'd like to sit down and just, just talk to you. And I promise I'm not going to preach to you. I'm not, going to, I, I'm not going to make any comments. I just want you to tell me the truth. And they all agreed for me to interview them. And so I can remember I sat down and I listened to their stories. But as I was listening to their stories... Suddenly, everything I read in the Word of God came into focus. 
not just from the story of this wonderful father we read a moment ago, but the stories throughout the scripture of children who walked away and some who returned and some who did not. But as I read through that, I discovered from the scriptures what I call the six principles for getting your son or daughter back to God. And I want to share that with you this morning because some of you, you've had kids walk away and you've asked those questions. So here's principle number one, and it's the one you can start practicing today. You need to learn to live guilt-free in your Christian life. You see, when people ask the question, what did I do wrong? Here's what they're saying. Obviously, I made a mistake as a parent or my children would be serving God. So if you have a prodigal child, here's what you have done. You have gone back to the day they were born and you have analyzed every day to the present trying to find a reason for their prodigal life. So you find yourself thinking, well, maybe if we lived in a different community, if they had gone to a different school, if we had gone to a different church, if I had, a, had forced them to have different friends, you've analyzed every reason you can find to try to explain why they're doing what they're doing. And the end result is you feel so guilty because you can't find a reason. And so you sit in church defeated, and sometimes you don't want to serve because you have prodigal children. Well, I want to tell you, I've done the research, both biblically and practically, and if you've ever wondered what you did wrong, in a moment, I'm going to answer that question once and for all. You'll know when you walk out of here what you did wrong, and the answer is going to surprise you. So hold on. Don't feel guilty yet. Let, let me just pause for a moment before I answer that question what you did wrong, and ask you this question. Why do you feel guilty when you have adult children who are involved in things or commit sins? Why do you feel guilty? Well, I'm going to tell you, there's two reasons why you feel guilty. One is because there's a simple truth that we never apply to our children. We say it. If it's said in church, we amen it. We'll apply it to everyone else but not to our kids. Here's the biblical truth. You have said it. You've heard it said. All of us are sinners. Period. Let me say it another way. All of us are bent toward sin. If all of us do what is natural for us to do, all of us would be prodigals. So the real question is not why in a pastor's home of five boys is one a prodigal. The real mystery is why are four serving God? Because if you do what is natural, we all fulfill our sinful pleasures. But the real source of that guilt comes from a second source. And it's one of those verses in the Bible, one of the few verses in the Bible that everybody can quote, but few can tell you where it's found. And for example, here's the verse. Preacher, doesn't the Bible say, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. See, all of you want to say, absolutely, that's in the Bible. Where? You're right. It's in Proverbs 22, 6. It's in the Bible. I'm not setting you up for a trick question. So you say, see, that verse says right there that if you do it right, your kids always turn out right. Well, hang on just a minute. Do you know you cannot find three competent Hebrew scholar, Hebrew was the language in which it was written, that will tell you that verse implies that if you're a perfect parent, you get perfect kids. Now, there's several schools of thought on it. If you read Warren Worsby, he says, remember, it's a principle, not a promise. If you read people like Gary Smalley, who's written a lot on family issues, he tends to go back to the root of the word that it really has to do with the bending of a tree or allowing a child to pursue their interests. For example, if they love music, you train them in music, they'll pursue music the rest of their life. But I tend to take, as I've studied that scripture, a different view. Not that it says if you do it right, they always turn out right. But here's what I believe it is the promise. That if you teach your children right, if you teach them the things of God, if they choose to walk away, they cannot forget what they were taught. 
and it will always be a silent conviction in their life. Every prodigal I interviewed said to me, I know what I'm doing is wrong. Well, I didn't tell them. Well, do you know that? Well, I was taught different. I know what the Bible says. I'm choosing to do what I want to do. And so sometimes we need to go back and look at that verse and say, if you train up a child in the way he should go, it cannot depart from him. He can't forget it. So don't be feeling guilty because you read that verse and think, well, that proves I did something wrong. Now, I know what happens at the close of a service like this. After I say that, someone walks up to me and they want to debate it. And I have found, a, oh, preacher, I believe if you do it right, your kids always turn out right. I've noticed a common characteristic of all of those people. None of them have children. <laughs> oh, they have kids, all right. They're called imaginary kids. You ever have any friends with imaginary kids? They're the people that say, like, now, I don't have any children, but I'm going to tell you, if I ever have a child, my child would never do that. Now, can I just park right there for a moment? You know, sometimes as a preacher, I've learned there's stuff that's biblical truth just because Christians have experienced it, but I can't give you a verse for it. Well, I want to tell you one of those things. Now, hold on. Don't, don't turn me off just yet. If you're here and you don't have children, you're one of those people who say, well, I ever have kids. My kids will never do that. All right, I'm going to get a witness here in just a minute. It's going to prove to you what I'm saying is biblical truth. I really believe it. I believe in heaven when you say that because God's got a sense of humor. And when you say, no child of mine will ever do that, I think God hears that in heaven, and he turns to that angel in charge of the DNA and says, hey, would you write that down? <laughs> Just put that down. And when God gives you a child and the DNA committee gets together and that angel walks in and pulls that file, they will make your kids do on an hourly basis what you swore you would never let them do. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Amen. That's true. So you don't think for a moment. And then there's other people who are blessed to have kids who are serving the Lord. And if we're not careful, sometimes we can get a little prideful and say, well, we must have done it right. But there's still people who want to say, oh, no, I believe if you do it right, they always turn out right. And so you're sitting here and you're asking that question, Brother Phil, you promised, what did I do wrong? So let me give you the answer to that. You ready? The evidence scripturally and practically is you probably did nothing wrong. Do you know you can be a perfect parent and have perfect kids and they still choose to walk away? You say, well, I don't believe that. I still believe if you do it right, you turn out right. Okay, hang on. If you believe that if you do it right, and you do it like God wants you to do it, and you do it perfectly, your kids always turn out right, then I'd like to ask you a Bible question. What did God do wrong with Adam and Eve? You had a perfect father who, by the way, had perfect kids, who had no peer pressure, and they lived in a perfect environment. And they walked away. So here's what I want you to understand at the very outset. If you have kids that are prodigals, you need to stop letting the devil intimidate you. And until the Holy Spirit tells you what you did wrong, you need to say today, I will assume I did nothing wrong and I will not feel guilty anymore. Because if you feel guilty, I need to tell you, if you feel guilty, your prodigal, especially if they have addictive behavior, will play to that guilt to get what they want. And for you to be able to help your prodigal, you have to be in a position of strength where you say, I'm not going to allow you to appeal to guilt, and from this day forward, I don't feel guilty anymore. Now, with that said, let me tell you the second principle. You say, but now, hold on, preacher, I, I know what I did. I know the sin I committed against my family. I know what I said. I know what I did. Okay, in that case, then principle number two is go to your prodigal and ask for their forgiveness. I'm amazed sometimes when, when as parents we do either individually, when we do sin, sometimes we get it right with each other, but we never talk to our kids. And when you go to your parents, I mean, your, your prodigal's, 
as their parents and you sit down and you look at them and say, look, I was wrong, I sinned, will you forgive me? Now, I need to go ahead and tell you they may not forgive you. But when you ask for their forgiveness, it removes that barrier that they can no longer use it as an excuse. So you ask for forgiveness. Now, here's the third principle. Along the way, you must also love your prodigal unconditionally. Well, Brother Phil, I do. I, I love my child unconditionally. Oh, really? Can I test that? Do you have a child, be honest, do you have a child today that you hope Brother Stephen and I never find out belongs to you? Just be honest. Or do you have a child that has done things that you sit in shame for fear people are going to find out what your child has done? Do you have a child that maybe alone just with your thoughts at night, you have said on occasion, I wish to God they had never been born? Well, if so, you don't understand unconditional love. Unconditional love says, there is nothing you can do to make me love you more, and there is nothing you can do to make me love you less. Unconditional love is not based on performance. It's based because of who you are. Now, it's easy for us as parents to say, I love my child with unconditional love until it is tested. Let me give you an illustration of two different men who went to church together who faced similar experiences and see if you can identify which one had set as his default mode in his life to unconditionally love his kids. The first is a man who was very active in his church. Uh, virtually everything you could be in the church position wise, you know, except being on the staff. He was just very active layman, deacon in the church, highly respected businessman. One day he's home and his 16-year-old his daughter comes in and says, Daddy, I need to talk to you. And he says, sure, honey, what do we need to talk about? She started crying and she said, Mother said she won't tell you and I need to tell you, but I'm going to be having a baby. Of course, she wasn't married. And the dad, by his own public testimony, got angry. How could you? Don't you know our reputation, my reputation, our family's reputation? How could you? You, you, you have just, you just drug our family name through, through the mud. I can't believe you're this type of person. And in his anger, he began to pound on the coffee table and scream at her and tell her what a sorry person she was. And then in his anger, he looked at her and he said, listen, I've made a decision. You go to your bedroom. You get all of your belongings. You get out of this house. And as far as I'm concerned from this day forward, you and your your baby are dead and I never want to see you again. And he bragged about it. You know what he told people? Put my foot down in my house. I took a stand against sin in my house. About six months later, in the church he attended, the pastor walked to the pulpit and the pastor said, I'm not preaching a sermon. I just need to talk to you as my congregation. And with tears streaming down his cheeks, he said, you're going to hear this. I want you to hear it from me first. My wife and I have learned from our daughter, who is 15, that she's going to be an unwed mother. We have cried a lot at our house. We, we, we've just taken a day or two just to sit and be with each other because we, we didn't know what to say. But my wife and I have told our daughter that we are committed to helping her through this process. We, we've, we're committed to having her rear the child if necessary. We're going to do whatever it takes to support her. And I want you to know, as the pastor, if that means I need to step down and you feel I'm unqualified, I will gladly do that and, and, and find another job. But I, I want you to know, as our congregation, that while we are ashamed of what our daughter has done, we are not ashamed she is our daughter. Now let me ask you, 
which of those two girls do you think is in church serving God today? It was the one who received unconditional love. My pastor friend who, who stood before his congregation said that. He didn't approve his daughter's sin. See, sometimes people say, oh, yeah, but if you don't take a stand, you're approving their sin. Hey, before you get too self-righteous, did God approve your sin when he loved you unconditionally? No. Now, with that being said, because here's where people get off track, because at that point, everybody can amen, which leads me, because by the way, the father in this story, he loved his son unconditionally. And you got to understand what his son did. His son not only renounced his citizenship, he became part of another country. He, he left all of his Jewish heritage behind and did the one thing that would wound his father more than anything else in Jewish culture was to feed pigs. That's what he was doing. And yet the father never stopped loving his son. But with that said, here's where people get off track. Principle number four is you must let prodigals face the consequences of their choices. You see, in the story of the prodigal son, the father could have sent him some money. That would have gotten him out of the hog pen, all right, but it wouldn't have gotten him home. He could have sent him some food, gotten him out of the hog pen, but it wouldn't have gotten him home. The father had enough wisdom to let him face the consequences of his choices. You see, sometimes when you have a prodigal child, you have to say, I love you unconditionally, which means I love you so much, you make the choice, you have to face the consequences. I'm willing to, to come to the jail every day and see you, but I can't get you out of jail. Now, I know first time something happens, you can extend grace, but when behavior is repeated, you have to practice tough love. Or you have to look and say, I, I, I know I'll help you get into a program to deal with the gambling addiction, but I cannot pay off your gambling debts anymore. You see, you have to sometimes look and say to our kids, you made a choice, I'll walk through you with it, but I'm not going to hire a lawyer or other things to remove the consequences. And if you're a young parent, I don't want this to offend you, but I need to, in love, tell you this. One of the things that we have is we're rearing a generation now, and I'm seeing it across this country, that from the very beginning, young people are not having to face the consequences of their choices. If you don't believe that, talk to anybody in public education these days. They will remind you that somehow it's never the kid's fault. It's, it's the teacher's fault. It's somebody else's fault. And I just need to tell you, someday your kids are going to face the consequences of their choices and more than likely it will involve a law enforcement officer. So please understand, love says, I'm going to let you face the consequences. I'll just walk you through it. And you let them face it. Now, here's principle number five. You must also guard your words. Watch what you say. When I interviewed those um, prodigals, there was one boy that I knew well, far from the Lord, and he actually said something. I thought, man, I couldn't write it better than that. He looked at me and he said, Brother Phil, I'm going to tell you, I don't understand my mama. I really don't understand my mama. I said, why do you not understand your mama? He said, well, my mama comes home from church on Sunday, and all she talks about is how sorry the preacher is. She don't like none of the music they sing. She don't like her Sunday school teacher. Matter of fact, she don't like anybody in her Sunday school class. And all she does all week is complain about everything they do. Oh, they change this, and I don't like that, and they change this. She spends all week talking about people, and she said, then on Sunday morning, she's in shock when I don't want to go to that sorry church with those sorry people and listen to that sorry preacher. <laughs> you know, years ago, my wife and I made a decision not, not that we always were successful, but there's always things in church life that upset you. But we just decided we're never going to talk about it in front of our kids. Because the very person you dislike the most may be the very person God wants to use in the life of your child. But you may destroy the influence they have with your words. And by the way, let me take that a step further. See, some of you have prodigal kids. You not only want your kids to get right with God, 
but you want them to come back to your church. And that's okay. But sometimes I have watched parents, when their kids do get their heart right with God, run them back to the pig pen because they're upset because they're not coming back to their church. And what do you do if they start going to a church and it's not a Baptist church? So here's what we do. We're good Baptists. You know what we do. Now, son, I have a friend who goes to that church, and I need to tell you a few things about that church. No, no, no. When, when your child gets right with God... You kill the fatty calf and rejoice. There may be a time later you can discuss it, but it may be that they find in another church that they can grow and flourish in their walk, and instead of condemning it, you need to be their cheerleader and praise God for it. But that's hard sometimes for us, especially of us who, who, who you know, your kids grew up here, and this is it, and you just can't understand why anybody wouldn't want to be a part of your church. I had a dear friend uh, who had a son, and, and his son made some horrible choices, stayed in trouble with the law and all that. And he would often call me and he would say, Brother Phil, would you pray for my boy? I'll pray for your boy. Please, Brother Phil, pray for my boy. I'd pray for him. So when he called me, if he was crying, I always would say, what has he done now? And he would tell me and I'd pray for him. So one night he called me and he was crying. So I knew his son had done something. And I said, Brother, what, what, what has your son done now? He said, Oh, Brother Phil, it's terrible. It's terrible. I said, what did he do? Yeah, Brother Phil, it's horrible. I said, what did he do? He said, my boy got right with God tonight. Why is that horrible? <laughs> because he's going to go to the Assembly of God Church. <laughs> and I said, okay, but why aren't you rejoicing that God used somebody from the Assembly of God to renew it? Brother Phil, you don't know that church, which I did. But he said, you don't know that church. They fall out in the floor and they run around and they jump over pews. And I said, listen, that may be true, but why aren't you killing the fatty calf and rejoicing that your son is back serving God because he's going to go to the Assembly of God church and they fall out in the floor and they jump over pews. You ever have those moments you just want to choke somebody? And I said, listen to me. I know the church. The pastor is a dear friend. He would tell you there are 51 verses in the Bible we take a total different view on. But I said, listen to me. He said, but you don't understand. They fall out on the floor and they run. I said, I will agree with you that their worship is a little excessive. I will agree that they're real emotional. I'm not debating that. But I said, listen to me. While they may run around and jump pews and everything else, you need to understand something. They're saved. They're going to heaven. Granted, they may go past it and have to turn around and come back, but they're going to heaven. <laughs> and I said, I am not endorsing their theology. Don't get me wrong. But I said, sir, if God used somebody from Assembly of God to get your son back to Jesus, you ought to kill a fatty calf and invite him to the celebration. See, our words can push kids away. So guard your words. And here's the final thing. You need to pray specifically for your prodigal. Oh, Brother Phil, I, I do, Brother Phil. I, I pray for my prodigal all the time. Well, can I help you with your praying? When I interviewed all of those prodigals who came back to serve in the Lord, there were several things God used, but there was one of two things that was in every testimony without exception. So if these are the two things, and a lot of times both were, if these are the two things God is using, shouldn't this be what you're praying? Here's the first one. God often uses a friend an associate that comes into their life that has a heart for God and through their friendship, they start being used by the Holy Spirit to nudge them back to the Lord. It might be a coworker. It might be somebody who's on the PTA committee with them. It might be somebody who plays golf with them. It might be somebody that helps coach softball. It, it could be a next door neighbor. But somewhere somebody has found a common interest with your prodigal and they love the Lord, and through their friendship, they nudge them back to the Lord. So the first thing you pray is, God, bring into the life of my prodigal people who love you. Then here's the second thing. You ready? It is often the sickness and death of a parent or grandparent that makes a prodigal evaluate their life. 
And it is often the sickness and or death of a parent or grandparent that brings a prodigal back into right relationship with the Lord. Now, if that's true, and this is hard, are you willing to say, Lord, whatever it takes, even if it means that I have to suffer and or go to heaven, I'm willing to do it to see my prodigal make right choices and start serving you. Now, let me tell you what I didn't say. I didn't say, you, you say today, Lord, kill me. I didn't say that. You don't say, Lord, I, I'm begging you, make me sick. No, 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 you missed the point. The point is that if you want to see your prodigals come back, it starts with you as a parent or a grandparent when you're willing to say, Lord, whatever it takes, and everything's on the table, including if I need to suffer and die to get my prodigal back to you. And can I tell you something? If you can pray that prayer and mean it, all this other stuff's easy. And then you're in a position of strength. In our office, we have several employees, and one day one of my employees came to me and said, I got a suggestion. Why don't we have everybody bring their lunch on Wednesdays for the next few weeks? And each Wednesday after we've ate lunch together that somebody in, our, in your, the office shares their personal testimony. Now, I obviously know all their personal testimonies. I've heard them. But I realized they hadn't always shared it with each other, and I thought that was a great idea. So I, I put a staff person in charge of assigning everyone a Wednesday, and they did. I took the first one, and everybody else took a a Wednesday to share their story, their testimony. And some Wednesdays I was in town, some I was not. But there was one Wednesday approaching that I was to be in town, but I knew for that staff member it was going to be very hard for me to share because her grandfather was my mother's oldest brother. Her grandfather was my uncle. And I knew her story. I knew how she was active in church and college, got away from the Lord, and I knew how later she returned to serve in the Lord. And I knew that it would be hard for her to share if I were present. In fact, I don't know if you know this, the hardest people to share your testimony in front of is your family. It just is. It's hard. And I knew it'd be hard for her, and, but I was scheduled to be in town. I needed to be there. So I just took it to the Lord in my quiet time, and I said, Lord, I don't know whether to be here or not be here. Well, my wife called me, and she said, listen, I know you got this thing going on on Wednesdays, but we've been invited to this luncheon. We need to go to this luncheon, and we, we need to do it. And I said, well, I'll take that as an answer from the Lord. So tell them we'll be at the luncheon. So that afternoon, I walked into Marla's office, and I said, listen, I need to tell you, I'm not going to be here tomorrow when you share. I don't think I could have told her she won the Publisher's Clearinghouse Sweepstakes and she'd been any happier. She looked at me and she said, oh, I'm glad. She said, I didn't want to tell you, but I've been praying all week you'd be sick and not able to come to the office tomorrow. <laughs> we don't have to pray that the next day we went to the luncheon and I came back and went into a young man who was an intern at the time and I said how did Marla do oh she did great told how she became a Christian young got away from the Lord in college and then she shared how it was the sickness and ultimately the death of her grandfather my uncle that caused her to evaluate her life and serve the Lord and boy when he shared that it pierced my heart because her grandfather had been to my office several times in years past asking me to pray with him about his grandkids. And every single time he would say, Lord, whatever it takes, I'm laying it out here. Lord, whatever it takes to get their attention, even if you need to take me to glory, I want you to do it. And sometime later, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer, fought it for two and a half months, and died. And it was during that sickness that Marla got her heart right with the Lord and actually wrote him a letter. And her father read it to, to him on, on the deathbed. But I can remember when I left my office that day, I was thinking about that and just rejoicing. And I sat in my truck for a moment and I just talked to the Lord. I said, Lord, man, thank you for the way she's serving you. Her husband's saved, and he's a leader in their church, and their kids, and they're all involved. She's on the praise team. It's just, it's just great to see what, but I said, Lord, I just, I just wish my uncle could have been here to see this. 
And then I got an idea. Now, don't, don't misunderstand me. We cannot talk to the dead, okay? But I can talk to the one who's with the dead. And I told the Lord, I said, Lord, would you do me a favor? If you're on the streets of heaven today and you see my uncle Bud, as we called him, would you tell him for me that his death was not in vain? Would you tell him for me that his granddaughter stood today and blessed your name? You tell him for me that his prodigal has come home. You see, I wish I could stand here and tell you, boy, there's a surefire for me. When you do this, your kids are going to be missionaries around the world. Can't do that. Because they make the choice to walk away. They're the only ones who can make the choice to return. What we've talked about today is getting you in a position of strength, not weakness, so that you can make right decisions so when they come to themselves, the young man never said, I wonder if I can go home. No. Father had made all the right decisions. He knew he could go home. He didn't know what the relationship would be like, but he knew he could go home so that you make the right choices that you're helping instead of hurting, that you are calling them to come back instead of pushing them away. You make the right choices, but here's what I can tell you. When you do that, God begins to work in the life of your prodigal. It might be a year, five years, 10 years, or 20 years, but I'm gonna tell you, it may be when you're in heaven, but wouldn't the next best thing to seeing your prodigal get right with God here would be walking on the streets of heaven one day and the Son of God walks over and says, have I got news for you, your prodigal bless my name, and came home. And prodigals do come home. When we're willing to start by saying, Lord, in my life, whatever it takes. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I realize in a service like this, when I share a message like this, (laughs) I realize that across this building that there are people sitting here today and right now your heart is very heavy. And here's what the devil wants to do. He wants to try to emotionally isolate you from this crowd. So here's what the devil's already telling you. You know everybody in this room, they know you're the only one with a prodigal friend. Let me tell you, that's a lie from the enemy. This room is filled with people today, and I don't even know their stories, that have children, maybe even teenagers that they know their heart's not right with the Lord, or adult children that have walked away. Well, I want to tell you that the enemy's a liar, and this is a safe place, and I want to tell you right now, friend, that this church will love you, and they're going to support you, and they're going to rejoice with you. When you today say, my heart is heavy, my heart is hurting, and you're willing to say, Lord, whatever it takes, I'm willing to do it. So in a moment, I'm going to have a prayer, and when we finish that prayer, we're all going to stand, and the choir will begin to sing. Brother Stephen and other staff and counselors are here. And if today you as an individual, maybe as a couple, you just want to come and say, Pastor, We're just coming to say whatever it takes. I'm willing to do it. Whatever it takes. For some of you, it may be the hard thing that you know now after hearing this that you've got to go and talk to a prodigal and ask for their forgiveness. Maybe maybe you realize, boy, you're going to have to practice tough love and stop removing the consequences. Maybe it's just you've got to guard your words. Or maybe just to say, I'm not feeling guilty anymore. But it all starts when you're willing to say whatever it takes. So here's what I'm going to do. The moment I'm going to pray, we're going to stand, the choir's going to sing. And when we do, from across this building, you know your heart is heavy because of a prodigal. It may not be your kids. It may be your grandkids. It may be a brother or sister. And the dynamics change a little bit, but still to be willing to say whatever it takes. I'm going to ask you to make your way from wherever you are and come to where Brother Stephen and other staff is to say today, I'm putting it all on the altar to say, Lord, whatever it takes. Some of you may be here today and you may be the prodigal. Boy, it's a great day to come say, Brother Stephen, I'm coming home. I want to get my life right with God. Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted Christ. We're inviting you to come and say, I'm not a Christian and I want to be. 
Maybe there's another decision you need to make. We invite you to come as well. But if you're a parent, grandparent, somebody with a prodigal in your family, I'm asking you, would you lead the way to say today whatever it takes? Father, it's your day. Give people the strength and the courage now to step out and come. They'll find victory. They'll find freedom. And most of all, they'll find hope. When they say today, I'm saying, Lord, whatever it takes, thank you as people are coming right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We stand, the choir is singing, and God is speaking. You come on right now, won't you? people are still coming. The Spirit of God is speaking. Don't let there be shame in your heart. There's a celebration of waiting. But it all starts when we say, Lord, whatever it takes. Let me just say real quick, this is a phenomenal message, but one thing that really spawned me amongst everything in there, you may very well be the prodigal. We've all been prodigals at one point in time prior to salvation, but if you're here today and you're not where you need to be with Christ, you're lost, you've never, you don't have a personal relationship with Him, I just want to give one more opportunity for you to come down here, leave your pride in the seat and confess Christ as your Savior and receive Him as your Savior. Or you may know Him, but you've been away from Him and experienced personal revival today. So every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm asking believers, if you'll just pray, if there's anyone left in this building that needs to make that return or that surrender, whatever condition it may be, you pray right here, right now, that God will do His work. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in Cleansing blood of the Lamb Are your garments 
spot my star that white as snow are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Well, amen. You may be seated. We have some folks making their club of professions of faith this morning. Gracie May, come stand by my side. Uh, Gracie May recently prayed to receive Christ as her Lord and as her Savior. I got to talk with her this past Wednesday. And she is an unashamed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you rejoice in Gracie May surrendering to Christ, let him know and say an amen. Thank you. amen. I know our folks want to come by and greet you as well. Walker, come stand by my side. This is Walker Britt. Walker uh, surrendered his life to Christ Friday night at the Low Country Boil. Amen. Praise the Lord. Bless you, Lord. And he's making his public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus this morning as well, and we've already rejoiced. God bless you, my dear brother. Thank you. I know the Lord's going to do a great work in your life and share your story uh, to others. Brother, what a phenomenal message. Um, you know, Brother Herb Rivas told me when he was here uh, that you had preached that message and done a, just a phenomenal thing, and, I, and that's what we discussed. And thank the Lord for you being obedient to following the Holy Spirit's leadership to preach that this morning. What a dynamic message it was. And by the way, these books are available at his table. This is the book that he just preached, but it goes more in depth. So if you want to get deeper into it, this is a great book here. Uh, uh, Stop Chasing Happy uh, is another one, and then Beyond the Trail. All three of these books are available at the book table outside, and, and uh, Brother Phil will be available uh, to speak with you and share with you uh, as well. Um, so please uh, take the time to go by there as well. And we are so, so blessed to have you, brother. You honored us this entire weekend and uh, looking forward, God willing, to you coming back to Rootville if you'd be willing to do so. Uh, we're, we're so thankful. Uh, so uh, we're going to be getting a new Easter series next Sunday, Building Towards Easter. It's Easter invites, lower level, upper level. Please take them, be on mission and sharing the gospel, inviting folks to be with us, our Easter celebration, but also Easter series beginning this coming Sunday. Tonight, I'm up with First Kings, Power Politics and a For Sure Hope. We're going to talk about three kings. There's, there's a total of nine. I'm going to do three tonight. Three of these kings, all, all nine of them were, were, they were, they were pretty interesting individuals. And it's going to drive to the point there's only one For Sure King. You don't want to miss this evening's message. So much life application you don't want to miss. I love you, the Lord. Be salt and light. Brother Brian. Can we have Brother our Phil. ushers come forward? Uh, if our ushers come forward, we're going to receive a love offering for Brother Phil today. If you love him and your, his ministry, we want, to, we want to challenge you to give. We want you to be a part of his ministry today. And so, man, if you just guys will get ready. Uh, you can also give online there. If you'd rather use your smartphone, to go through our app there. You can scan that QR code, and you can go straight to give an offering for Brother Phil as well as the place. Let's pray together. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to join me in prayer, not just for this offering. But for these families that are sitting here today hurting, that needed a little bit of hope, needed just a little bit of assurance from God's word and from God's man, that the Lord can do a work even when it just seems bleak, when it seems hard. Will you pray for these families with me today? Lord, I love you today. I thank you so much, God, for all you've done for us. We're unworthy, God, of the blessings you've given us in spite of trials, in spite of those that we face, God, that need you. And Lord, I pray that you'll start in us as he challenged and preached, God, to change us first. If we'll be what we need to be. And to see you do a miraculous work in those that we love. God, I pray that we'll bind together as a church that will help one another, that will lift one another up, that will not be divisive, that will be in love and harmony. And God, help those that are hurting so that we can rejoice with those that are celebrating. God, bless this offering today. Use your people to be a blessing today to Brother Phil and to his ministry to continue to use him in an amazing way. Lord, we love you and we thank you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Scotty, will you come? Scotty's going to come. He wants to share. Ushers, you can make your way forward now with this offering. Scotty. Thank you, Brent. First of all, I want to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are the greatest thing in my life, and I thank you and I love you. Second of all, I want to thank my wife, Marcy Birch. Man, I tell you, 
Y'all say a lot about Scotty this, Scotty that, Scotty this, Scotty that, and she has to hear every bit of the hard stuff on the back end. So thank you, Marcy and Caden and Cameron, for just hanging with me through the whole year because this thing goes on the whole year. And I don't want to miss anybody's name, so I want to thank all the men and all the women and the children uh, that just serve the Lord so mightily. It's, it's amazing to watch what happens on this campus. So thanks, everybody, for all you did for us. But most of all, like I said to begin with, thank you, Jesus, for saving me and giving me the heart to love you with everything I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Scotty. We appreciate your leadership. Thanks for leading these men to be leaders this past Friday night. I'll, I'll, say, I'll share these quick announcements, very important. Number one, we'll be getting information very quick to Celebrators Conference that will be in October that Brother Phil mentioned early on in his message, and that's an opportunity for any men and women to come and go and be a part of that conference in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. It's incredible. Every year, it's an amazing thing. Great music and great preaching, just like you heard today. And so if you want to participate, we'll be getting that information out to you very soon for that sign up. Uh, we always take a group every year. Also, the blood drives this Wednesday from 2 to 7 down in the Christian Life Center. And then also, we need host homes for D now. If you'd like to be a host home to help our kids during a huge discipleship weekend for our students, you need to see Andrew Tony, call the church office, let us know, and we'll get you connected. And then last of all, we're going to be doing a sign up for volunteers and for helpers for our Easter extravaganza on Friday, March the 29th. This is on Good Friday nights. Very important. Important. We need a lot of help. This, the number of this event has grown enormous. I mean, it is a lot of families and a lot of kids on this campus. And just like we work for Fall Festival, we need to work for the, for the egg hunt that Friday night. So we need help. We have a sign-up for you. There's something everybody can do. There's all kind of things from set up food to preparing food to not only that, just helping facilitate people and direct them to be a counselor. There's all kind of opportunities. So please help us make this event huge. Kids come to know Christ that, that Friday of Easter weekend. It's a great outreach opportunity to our community. We want to do all we can to be a part of it, all right? Don't forget Brother Phil's table down in the lobby. And also we have our brand new members down front. If you guys will come stand right here, come by and shake their hand. Tell them you're excited about their decision.